Thomas, you. that is the coordinator of the Peter project from the University of Brno, and he will talk about the strong coupling in plasmonics. So, works fine. Okay, so I will talk about strong coupling in plasmonics. It's not directly related to Peter, but I think it's an interesting effect. So, so I hope you will, will like it. And the work was done by our group. Those people are here at the Institute of Physical Engineering and Central European Institute of Technology in Brno, at Brno University of Technology. So, concerning I can see here, okay, the, sorry, the st strong coupling. Uh, it's uh, an effect you can get if you have, let's say two oscillators, uh, either classical or quantum ones, which have very, let's say, uh, or very small damping. It means uh, high quality of resonators, uh, narrow peaks, these resonant peaks, and they are tuned to the same energy. And then if it is, the, this conditions is met, then you can get the splitting of that peak and you get so-called uh, two, uh, or you get hy hybrid states and hybrid mode. And we call them that splitting, as you will see later on, Rabi, the Rabi splitting. And there are applications of that very interesting one, similar, for instance, to EIT, electromagnetically induced uh, uh, transparency. Uh, then quantum emitters, like single photon emitters, sensing, novel chemistry, and so on. And the question is how to realize that effect, how to realize those oscillators. Well, one will be, might be, electromagnetic cavity, and then another one, some emitter or absorber working in a narrow frequency range band. And concerning cavities, we can use either, sorry, sorry for that, either photonic dielectric resonators, which are, however, diffraction limited, or we can use metallic plasmonic resonators, let's say plasmonic antennas, which can go beyond diffraction limit. It means that you have the electromagnetic field confined in a very small volume. And according to this formula, you can get a large Rabi splitting. And interestingly, you can, it works also for the parcel factor because uh, here you, it depends on this Q over V, where Q is quantity. And even though the metallic resonators have much worse, poor, poorer quality com uh, compared to photonic resonators. Thanks to that high confinement, it means the small volume V, we can get very nice uh, factor and even serpa, 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 be better than uh, in case of those photonic resonators. It means it's possible to increase rate of spontaneous emission significantly, which helps to in this field like single photon emitters and so on. Okay, those are cavities, but what about emitters and, or absorbers? So you can either use, for instance, some dyes like J aggregate, some organic stuff, and you can have their excitants, or you can use also for that purpose quantum dots, or you can have phonons as an absorber in some narrow resonant uh, absorption range. And then, of course, I have already mentioned it, you have that Rabi splitting, which is also related to Rabi oscillations in the, if you have quantum oscillators, where the, in fact, in that uh, mixed state or hybrid state, you have oscillation between two states like plasmons and, uh, and phonons and so on, or any, or excitants. And if you have plasmon and excitants, then you, you can have that effect in visible or near infrared. If you go for phonons, you, you can have that effect in mid infrared and so on. And I would like to talk about this part, which maybe it's, it's closer to terahertz radiation, so it's more natural at this, at this workshop. Maybe. So, what kind of absorber we have chosen? So this is we we we, we choose uh, we, we we chose silicon-rich oxynitride, 
thrown, which is an interesting material because upon annealing, after annealing at this temperature, you can get nanocrystalline silicon it's from the excessive silicon, which precipitates there, and it's photoluminescence active. But I will uh, pay attention to, let's say, un, to the pristine silicon rich oxynitride unannealed one. And that material has such a refraction of index where you can clearly see that there is really absorption, high absorption in the range, let's say from eight to 13 micrometers. And it is caused due to uh, by vibration modes related to silicon oxygen and silicon nitrogen bonds. And we have on, on the, the thin film made of, of such a material, we deposited gold antennas by electron beam lithography. We, we, chose, uh, let's say, double arm antennas to have a narrow gap between, and it means to have an enhanced electric field and confined field there. And we have fabricated arrays of antennas to have better signal to noise ratios. And measurements were done by Fourier transfer infrared spectrophotometer equipped with a microscope, so we have uh, easily find, uh, found those structures and then took uh, spectra, for instance, of, uh, of uh, uh, reflection on transmission spectra out of that small area. Okay, so you can see here our first experiments. At the beginning, we had a spectrophotometry which was limited only to, let's say, to nine, nine micrometers, and we measured reflectance is a function of the length of antennas, of the arms of antennas. And we got peaks for each, or peak for each lens. We, and the, the, that maxima, maximum corresponded to uh, resonances, plasmon resonances. And with the growing lens, the peak was, or the peaks were shifting to the uh, longer wavelengths naturally. And if we made the graph of the position of those maxima as a function of the lens of antenna, lens and position of peaks means resonance wavelengths, we got such a curve, which was completely different from in that time usually known straight line dependencies like, like you can see, see here which were typically the time for antennas on transparent, not absorbing materials. So, and for us, because it stopped, it didn't grow up, it was a little bit puzzle for us, and, but which later on became the, the problem much clearer because you have found the second part of the story when we got a spectro spectroscope which was able to go up to 16 or 20 micrometers or something like that. And you, go, you, you could see that after peak, you have that valley, and then there is another additional, additional peak. And if you look at that, for instance, this is our simulation, which nicely uh, co copies those experiments. Then you, you might start thinking about splitting of the peaks and kind of rubby splitting, maybe strong coupling. Yeah. So we have made the similar gra graph like before. It means that there was the left-hand side peaks gave us such a branch and, but if we took position of those peaks, then we got another branch. And you can see here a clear splitting between those branches, which in fact, uh, is the effect exactly the same like here, which very well known from literature, and we call, uh, call it anti-crossing because if you have no, and caught, in fact, caused, caused by coupling, if you have no coupling, we have this crossing. In our case, it's we have the phonons here, and here we have plasmon, peak ideally, and we have clear crossing. But once you have some, let's say, Coupling, you get get that splitting. And I must say here that in plasmon, it's there is a convention that if you see clearly the splitting, and this is our case, you start to talk it to to call it strong coupling, even though you will see you might not 
meet the exact condition for strong coupling. Yeah. Okay, and this is splitting due to due to coupling between plasmons and those silicon oxygen vibration modes. And what about silicon nitrogen? Yeah, if you look at the right hand side peak, you see here uh, some some modulation, some mild ve ve valley. So in principle, you have two peaks. So if we take then the position of those peaks as a function of the length of the antenna, we get additional branch, which corresponds to that silicon nitrogen vibration modes, vibration modes coupling with, with plasmons. Okay, so this is the full picture of that. And then we should answer the question, do we have, is or is it so-called, let's it's strong coupling or just absorption? Because we know that we have, that we must get value in reflectance, which is here. But according to this equation, if you go down with, with uh, reflectivity or with the reflectance, then or reflect, reflection, and the transmission, or sorry, the absorption might go up as well, and you don't have the strong coupling. The condition for that coupling is that transmission must go down, up. So to prove that you have a, at least qualitatively some strong coupling effect, you should add additional uh, measurements in, 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 in addition to reflectance, you should measure also tra transmittance. I really did it. And you can see that really here, where we have the minimum in reflectance, we have maximum in, in transmittance. And uh, similarly to our in, our, it's in our simulations, minimum, maximum, and also for that, that uh, the secondary minimum corresponding to silicon nitrogen, modes, so it's also here and here. So this is qualitatively strong coupling, but the question is how strong is strong coupling? Yeah, and to answer it, we should go for simulations or better said, fitting the, let's say the, the experimental, uh, experimental measurements of re 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 reflectivity or scattering cross section and so on. I will tell more uh, tell more about it uh, in a while. But you should have first the uh, model, and uh, that model my, we have chosen uh, oscillator like model that we have a spring corresponding to plasmon, representing plasmons, another spring corresponding to, to phonons, for instance, silicon oxygen ones. In fact, we should have here also a, an, a, a, so the second spring corresponding to silicon nitrogen uh, bonds. And then of course, some coupling represented by DG. And the outcome of that, uh, of that simu simulation of that model in form, for instance, of scattering cross-section should be fitted to this data. Uh, usually you can, or you can do it with, to, with experimental data or with numerical data we, ha we have calculated because our simulations nicely corresponds to the experiment and then you have, don't have their noise and it's, it's free of noise and it's better fitting. And uh, out of that, you can get parameters like resonant energies, it means resonant wavelengths or frequencies, damping coefficients, and also coupling coefficients. And once you have it, you can start to think how strong is your strong coupling? Because for the strict condition for strong coupling, cup, coupling is that, that coupling coefficient should be bigger than our uh, damping coefficients, it means losses in those oscillators. So it should be bigger, this parameter to those damping coefficients. And then we did those calculations for all uh, antenna lens. And then we found that for specific wavelengths, we have parameters corresponding to G, which are approaching, starting approach G, the gamma, it means damping coefficients. So we can say that we are at the onset of strong coupling. Not we are not, we don't fully um, meet the, those that conditions, but it's uh, let's say onset of strong coupling. And then there is also another issue. I have mentioned that we get hybrid polaritonic modes, which are a mix of photonic and phononic states. And it's good 
to know what is the fraction of that states in that, in that mode. And the answer is given by the so-called Hopfield field coefficients, where you, you, you can see them here. That it's a, like a fraction of those individual states, and you can get it out of uh, Hopfield field bogolubok matrix or equations where you have parameters from our previous simulations like uh, uh, resonant wave plans, and some coupling coefficients and so on. And the eigenvectors of the, of the equation are in fact, or the second power of them are those whole field coefficients. And then once knowing, uh, for instance, the resonant conditions, you can make the dependence of, of, uh, of resonant uh, wavelengths as the lens of antenna. So you get once again, those three, three uh, branches and uh, then you can also calculate for different lengths of antennas also hot field coefficients. And just let me demonstrate only in a detail, just one thing, for instance, one branch to comment here for shorter antennas, you have resonances which are far away from the area where we, the pristine silicon rich oxynitride have, uh, have, has uh, large absorption. So, it, it means that plasmonic uh, state or oscillations, electron oscillations are well developed. And that's why there are plasmons prevailing to phonons. Plasmons are red and, red and black are those phonons SIO. And when you start to increase the length of antennas, then you are approaching that area of strong absorption. And then uh, of course, uh, plasmons are being damped, and then there are prevailing phonons. And a similar analysis we can make for all those branches. Okay, let's go to more, maybe more, more practical uh, effect. And this is the absorption under strong coupling. Because I have mentioned that we very often those that, of course, coupling is generally utilized in for that de detection or for sensing. So we shine the light on that such a system and we like to maximize or to get high absorption inside of that material. And then we get, for instance, increase of temperature there and we can measure that this is a sensor. But the problem is we are in the, in the regime of strong coupling because I have told you that that uh, if you when strong coupling somewhere here, they this is that valley, that minimum, but we have their higher uh, transmittance. It means the uh, material becomes more transparent. It means the absorption here is smaller. So definitely we should go somewhere out, out of that uh, little bit conditions. And how to go there, there it's, it's given by this formula where we have for the power absorbed in that, for instance, in Sron, we have this very well known formula where there is product, and this is important product of the, the absorption in the pristine material without antenna and uh, that enhancement of electric field due to antenna. And then you can make a graph like this, where here is the wavelength, resonant wavelength, this is the length of the of the antenna and, uh, and uh, here is the relative power which absorbed in the gap. And this is power absorbed there taken to the power absorbed without the antenna. So here we have in fact magnification or, or, or enhancement of the absorption due to antenna. We can see that we, uh, in here in this area where we would suppose the without antenna higher absorption, we have the minimum one and the maximum is in you know, both branches here and here. And this is even it's 60. It means we have 60 time or fault higher uh, absorption due to antenna. And similar absorption efficiency, but due to shortage of time, I will skip it. And then going to my last slide, when in fact, uh, the, which is answering the question, how to find the optimal, optimal resonant uh, wavelength. So look here, if we re increase resonant wavelength, it means uh, the length of antenna, we increase the electric field 
enhanced by antenna. This is good because our uh, absorb, the power absorb, uh, power go up. But when we come to absorption, or the, the area where strong has pristine strong strong without antenna has strong absorption, it starts to go down because plasmons are being damped, and then, then it's almost zero, which is bad. So we definitely should go to some some trait of frequency or, or wavelengths where we are still closer to that absorption. It means it's not zero. And we have a reasonable enhancement of electric field. And once we have such an optimum conditions, we can go for, for the detectors and for instance, to measure temperature in the gaps of those antenna by some, some thermistors or made out of metallic lines and uh, and so on, and because the uh, power is absorbed in one in that gap and it's localized, we can make a matrix or pixels out of that and it can be for instance used and we are working on that on kind of night vision camera and so on. So, and let me uh, come to the conclusion. I have, we, we have shown that the onset of the strong coupling in plasmonics, we have found optimum conditions at managed to enhance the absorption by a factor of 60. And at least according to simulations so far, it's necessary to mention, and that the, that the approach can be used for other frequency ranges like invisible infrared solar cell sensors and detectors. So thank you very much. And this is acknowledgement okay, of our my colleagues and the grounds. Thank you very much. Sorry for being too late. <clears throat> okay, don't worry. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Now we have some time for questions. Not much, but if you have any question, please go ahead, raise your hand or... Okay, questions? Okay. Perhaps Magnus, I can please. take. Yeah. I can have a short one. So thank you for nice, uh, nice presentation. So I, I think you talked about it in the end, but just yes, to, to to be sure. So you act, you see a dip in absorption uh, at the uh, you see splitting also in absorption, and that is a nice uh, feature of the strong coupling. Is it is it correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, we should prove it experimentally. Those graphs were done. It was the simulation, but seems that it's we should really get in the mode of strong coupling. If we yeah. set uh, set to proper resonant frequency, we can increase the uh, significantly absorption towards the material without the antenna. Okay, because you showed transmission spectra and reflection spectra, it was nice to see that you get an enhancement in transmission. But if you if you combine them and, and uh, extract absorption, do you get a dip then at the original frequency? That would be a nice uh, feature of the coupling process. Okay. Uh, maybe we can talk later, but uh, very, very nice uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Christoph, please. Okay, just go ahead. Thank you, yeah. thank you for the very nice talk. So I have a question is about uh, if since the city is the silicon substrate can also have some polynomials. So what will it can you also find some coupling effect if you directly fabricate net antenna on silicon substrate? On silicon. Yeah, but do you <laughs> there is the condition that the absorption should be in a very narrow range yeah so you should have some re kind of resonator and uh, in fact in c case of silicon this is only in i think visible or something like that and don't sure i am not sure that it's so there is such a resonant let's say absorption yeah so but definitely silicon or silicon dioxide there yes definitely because there is that silicon oxygen bond, you will, you can get it there. And you can even get there, not only uh, those uh, uh, transversal modes, but also longitudinal one. And you can see that effect. Yeah, thank you. 